Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, P53 and the response to mitogen overactivity. So, so far, what we have considered is uh, we are overstimulating a cell, basically, with growth factor. And um, we've seen so far that if you uh, overstimulate uh, a cell with growth factor, the growth factor is going to bind to the growth factor receptor, it's going to change the conformation of the growth factor receptor so that the growth factor receptor can now dimerize with another buddy that has changed conformation upon uh, binding growth factor. Uh, and then autophosphorylation occurs where the, the, um, uh, the two members of the um, growth factor receptor dimer phosphorylate each other's tyrosine residues. Then what happens is the growth factor receptor binding protein 2 uh, comes along and uh, binds to um, the phosphorylated tyrosine residues on the intracellular domain of the uh, growth factor receptor. And then uh, that recruits the protein SOS. And we've probably got this. Where have I drawn all of this? Uh, it's over here. Right. So that recruits the protein SOS, uh, and SOS basically uh, converts RAS GDP into RAS GTP. So when SOS binds the growth factor receptor binding protein 2, uh, it becomes uh, an active G protein activating um, uh, enzyme. So it's going to chop off that GDP, it's going to find a GTP from the cytoplasm, and it's going to bind that GTP onto the RAS instead of the GDP. Now, RAS GTP is then going to bind with this RAS kinase, and the two of them are, are then together going to become an active kinase. Well, RAS is the kinase, but RAS, bind, RAS GTP uh, binding to the RAS kinase is going to activate it. Okay, right. So then what we saw was this uh, RAS kinase is going to add a phosphate group onto our MEC uh, enzyme, uh, which is also a kinase, and it's often sometimes referred to as the mitogen-activated protein kinase kinase, the reason being that it then phosphorylates and activates the mitogen-activated protein kinase, or MAP kinase, or sometimes referred to as ERK for extracellular signal regulated kinase, which is the um, main enzyme of this pathway. This is the enzyme after which this entire pathway is named. This is called the MAP kinase ERK pathway. So it is named completely and utterly after this enzyme. Right, so what does this enzyme do then? Well, basically, it takes an inactive transcription factor, which is named the, the transcription factor MYC, so M-Y-C, and basically it's going to stick a phosphate group onto it, which is what kinase enzymes do. So it's going to stick a phosphate group onto MYC, and that's going to activate MYC. So you have activated this transcription factor MYC, and MYC has a title just like just like P53 has this uh, grandiose title, the guardian of the genome, MYC has a title as well. It's often called the cell's most powerful mitogen, i.e. Um, it causes cells to divide when it has been activated. So, uh, MYC basically is a very powerful transcription factor, which is going to go into the nucleus and cause the transcription of um, the, well, the increased transcription of genes associated with um, cell division. So it's basically going to move the cell from the interphase of uh, the cell cycle into the G1 phase. So uh, basically, when we have exposed our cell, which was not previously dividing at all, to the growth factor, it means that the activity of this MYC uh, transcription factor is going to increase. Okay, and uh, what MYC does is it increases the transcription of proteins that you're going to need in order to replicate. So it moves you from the interphase of the cell cycle into the G1 phase. So it's going to start increasing the transcription of proteins that you're going to uh, need in order to um, split into two. So for instance, uh, if you've got a cell that is going to divide into two,
then it's going to have to replicate a lot of the proteins involved in metabolism, and it's going to have to make uh, more proteins involved in signaling and all of that, because it now needs to have the, a, num a number of those proteins uh, suitable for two cells rather than just one cell. So you're going to get uh, production of those sort of proteins, and also you're going to get proteins involved uh, with DNA replication. Um, and that's going to uh, get you ready, basically, to copy the DNA of the cell, which is an essential part of um, uh, cell division. Okay, so basically, MYC is going to cause the cell to enter the cell cycle. Right, so move from interphase, where you're not dividing, into the first growth phase of the cell cycle, enter cell cycle. Right, now, if MYC levels in the cell cytoplasm are too high, then what it's going to do is it's going to activate p53 and the way in which it activates p53 is through another protein known as ARF. So, to understand how MYC activates ARF we need to look at the basic principle of a transcription factor. Okay, so in eukaryotic DNA all genes have upstream, upstream of them uh, something known as a promoter region. So let's say this box that I've drawn here represents a gene, so I will draw that in green. So this is a gene, and let's say um, it specifically represents the ARF gene, which is this protein uh, through which um, too high MYC levels is going to activate P53. Okay, now all genes in eukaryotic cells have upstream of them a promoter region. Now, the purpose of promoter regions is not to code uh, for protein. The purpose of them is to control the expression of the gene, basically. Uh, so, how do they do this? Well, in order to um, express the gene, in order to make the gene product associated with this gene, what you need to do is you need RNA polymerase to come and bind to the DNA and um, to make its way down the DNA and synthesize a mRNA strand, a complementary mRNA strand to the coding strand of the DNA, i.e. it needs to make mRNA that's complementary to the DNA, which is then going to go into the cytoplasm and be translated into the protein. So, um, basically, this promoter region is where the RNA polymerase enzyme comes to bind. So, the promoter region controls how much the gene is transcribed, because um, if the promoter region has high affinity for binding RNA polymerase, then RNA polymerase will come and bind here more often, you'll get more mRNA produced, you'll make more of the protein. Whereas if this has low affinity for the RNA polymerase, you won't get as much mRNA produced, you won't get as much expression of the protein. Okay, so certain proteins can come and bind to the promoter region and alter the affinity of it for, um, for the RNA polymerase enzyme. An example of this is MYC. MYC is a transcription factor. So transcription factors are proteins or molecules which bind to DNAs, promote well, to bind to the promoter regions of DNA and alter the affinity of um, the promoter region for RNA polymerase. So MYC here has come along and has bound to the promoter region of this ARF gene and basically is going to increase the affinity of that promoter region for uh, RNA polymerase. So you're going to get more transcription of this ARF gene, you're going to get more mRNA being produced, and therefore you're going to get more ARF protein produced. So let's just draw some ARF protein now. So what does this ARF protein do then? Because basically this is what's going to lead to the activation of uh, P53. So MYC levels are too high, it causes the production of this ARF protein. So how is this ARF protein now going to activate P53? Well, basically, in order to understand that, we need to revise what is keeping P53 inactivated in um, usual cells. Okay. So, in normal cells, what happens is you produce some P53, Okay, so the P53 gene is constantly being transcribed and then translated, so you're constantly making P53. Now, to stop this P53 from ever doing anything, what you do is you create a protein called MDM2. 
okay? And I think this stands for mouse dependent minute two or something. Um, I don't know what, quite how it came to have that name, but um, anyway, it is a protein which binds to p53 here and basically stops it from functioning. And not only that, not only does it bind to the p53 and stop it from functioning, but it also targets it for ubiquitination. Okay, so what's going to happen is you're going to ubiquitinate this p53, like so. Okay, and then the p53 is going to go through the proteasome and get destroyed. So here we have got the ubiquitin group being added on. And now uh, p it's going to go through the um, proteasome and be destroyed. So that is how MDM2 ensures that P53 never actually does anything in the cell. It's made, it binds to the MDM2, and then it's destroyed, okay? So MDM2 basically is stopping P53 from ever having a function within the cell. Okay, so let me just finish the labeling here. This green group is meant to represent a ubiquitin group, okay? Uh, and uh, this red protein is still MDM2. Right, okay, now, so, in order to get P53 to become active, all you need to do is inactivate this MDM2 protein, and that is exactly what ARF does. ARF basically binds to MDM2, and then stops it from being able to bind to the P53. Oh, whoops, ARF. Okay, so it binds to this MDM2, stops it from being able to bind to P53, and then what happens is the P53 is free and ready to go, basically. Okay, so, so far, what has happened? We have overstimulated our cell with um, growth factors. That leads to overactivation of this um, MYC transcription factor. Overactivation of the MYC transcription factor leads to the production of this ARF protein, which for some reason I've coloured in a different colour. Never mind. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. That should be orange. Uh, uh, that leads to the um, uh, production of this ARF protein, which binds to this protein MDM2 and sequesters it so that it cannot then bind uh, to P53. So P53 is left free, basically, in the um, cytoplasm of the cell. So here is P53 now. Okay, so... P53 is now activated. It's alerted to the fact that the cell is dangerously overstimulated and potentially could be cancerous. Okay, so if you've got ridiculously high mitogen levels, that you can think of this as a protection basically against cancer. It's saying, okay, we've got mitogen levels that we should not have, mitogen levels that suggest that we ourselves have become carcinogenic, and P53 needs to now be activated. So what does P53 do? Well, basically, P53 is a transcription factor. Now, it actually, um, the details are that it actually forms a tetramer in order to become a, tra um, a transcription factor. So basically, four active P53 molecules need to all bind together, and then it can bind to promoter regions of genes and alter the transcription of those genes. So let's say here is our P53 tetramer. Let's say here is our promoter region, which we're bound to, and basically it's going to increase the transcription of certain genes. So what genes is it going to increase the transcription of? Well, Firstly, it's going to increase the transcription of a protein known as P21. P21 basically arrests the cell cycle, so it's going to completely stop the cell from dividing. Arrests the cell cycle. And if you want to see exactly um, how P21 uh, arrest the cell cycle, watch my other video on uh, P53, the prior video to this on uh, DNA damage. Okay, and also, it will potentially activate pro-apoptotic pathways, depending on how bad uh, the signaling is, so how, um, how much P53 you have, and also how long the P53 is activated for, so pro-apoptotic proteins, okay, which are going to potentially cause the cell to commit suicide. 
So basically, if you've got this dangerously overactivated cell, P53 is going to make proteins that completely stop that cell from dividing. And it's also going to potentially make proteins that are going to kill the cell and make it commit suicide, basically. So this, if you like, is an inbuilt protection against a cell becoming carcinogenic. But we do still have cancer. How can we have cancer even though uh, this pr we have this brilliant system? Well, in most cancers, what you find is that P53 has completely lost its function, i.e. you have got mutations in your two P53 genes, which means that it no longer has functions, has function anymore. And in fact, it's a little bit more subtle than that because of the fact that the P53 forms tetramers in this way. So what you can actually find is that actually you may only need one mutation, i.e. only one of your P53 genes might need a mutation in it in order for you um, to lose this mechanism because if um, one of the p53 genes is faulty then a half of the p53 you're going to produce is going to be faulty and a half of it's going to be working okay but if you think about these tetramers forming what if the faulty p53 still forms the tetramers then most of the tetramers you form are going to have a mixture of working and faulty p53 tetramers and only one sixteenth of them are going to be entirely working p53 um, molecules so what if the tetramer only works if all of them are working then basically just by knocking out one of the p53 genes you uh, basically are going to um, lose um, you're basically going to be reduced to down to a 16th of the healthy function of p53 so let me explain that a little bit more because this is an important concept so we have these two p53 genes here okay so then let's say only one of them is faulty so one of them has pro is producing bad faulty p53 so let's say this one is the bad one in red and we'll have green as the goodie just like in harry potter right so here is the green gene which is working now that means that half of the p53 you produce is going to be this working type and half of it's going to be um this faulty type so here's the faulty p53 now if you think about forming tetramers of this okay then what's the probability now that the tetrama you form is going to be made up of four working P53s? Well, the probability of picking one, if you, if you were to randomly pick a P53 molecule from this mush of P53, the probability that you get a working one is a half, but you have to pick four times. So if you want the probability of getting four working copies of p53 so you want the probability of getting four working copies of p53 so let me color that in green then effectively it's the probability of getting one then times that by the probability again times it again do it four times so it's a half which is the probability of picking one working p53 molecule times a half again which is again the probability that the second one you pick is a, a working one times a half, which is the probability that the third one you pick is a working one, and then times the a half again, which is the probability that the fourth one you pick is a working one. So overall, it's a sixteenth. So overall, only a sixteenth of the tetramers you form are going to be working tetramers. So in fact, even though uh, half of the P free P53 is working and half of it is not, the actual function of the p53 as a transcription factor is reduced down to a sixteenth, okay, potentially. And that mechanism there is known as dominant negative, okay? Because um, even though, even though um, you've only got one of the genes uh, that has a mutation in, basically the... Um, the bad p53 is capable of inhibiting in some sense the good p53 so the loss of function of this uh, p53 that you have is much greater than just a half basically so um, 
The overall message is that we ourselves do have an intrinsic protective uh, scheme against themselves becoming cancerous. They have this P53 mechanism whereby it can sense the levels of um, mitogens in the cytoplasm such as MYC and if they get too high it's going to cause the arrest of the cell cycle and potentially the apoptosis of the cell. And that protects the metaorganism from uh, cancerous cells. However, this means that most tumours you see, most cancer, has mutations in P53, so that this pathway is not working. And it usually has to be one of the early mutations that you get, i.e. Uh, in order for the cancer to develop, this has to go pretty early on, because otherwise it's just going to wipe the cancerous cells out. So this is one that generally you get very early on in the development of cancer, and then it allows the further development of cancer. Because if you were to um, get some of the later mutations, which, for instance, if you were to get a gain-of-function mutation in MYC, it, you would expect this P53 pathway just to wipe that cell out. But if you had it happening the other way, if you first got a mutation in P53, which wiped this pathway out, and then got a gain of function mutation in MYC, then you get a cell which divided out of control because um, the P53 pathway would not be there to stop the cell dividing in response to these dangerously high uh, MYC levels.